Good morning, family. I'm Mike McKelvey. I'm the lead pastor of Family Church. I'm extremely excited about the new year. Happy new year to everybody watching today. Although closing church on the very first Sunday of 2024 is not that exciting and not a great start. It is part of living in the Northeast. So you are snowed in. We are snowed in. So let's be snowed in together. And we have a few days notice to get prepared for this. And I thought since you're sitting at home in your living room, in your pajamas, or laying in bed, that we would invite you into our office space where we spend most of our time working together and have a conversation around a brand new topic that we have started. Fun information, Wednesday night, we started our Wednesday night Bible study. We had over 200 people signed up for it. A few people were sick, about 50 uh, so a little bit smaller start than we thought we were going to have, but what a great impact. And the topic was around the Bible. And since we were writing the course about the Bible, we thought, what a great way to start the year by talking to the church about how to read their Bible, how to engage in the Word of God. So we're starting the new year with a practical series about how to read the Bible, how to experience the Bible in a new and living way. And I'm going to ask you, don't tune me out because you say to yourself that you're not a reader, all right? I understand that. I understand a lot of people can try to get into the Bible, and they're like, I've gotten in there, and I've tried to read, and I don't understand it. We're going to give you basic information. We're going to set this whole thing up in a very practical way that we can apply the principles of reading the Bible to our daily lives. But before we begin, let's jump in and pray. Father, we thank you for this time that we can get into your word. We can have a conversation around the Bible, around Jesus Christ and why he came to earth. We pray today as we're snowed in that you would open the eyes of our understanding, enlighten us to your truth, show us things to come. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 All right, now I want to start with this. We all read something. We all read something. Right? If someone says, I'm not a reader, I don't enjoy reading, I understand that. Maybe you don't like reading textbooks or information books or fantasy books, but at some point in our lives, we are all going to read something, whether it's a sign or instructions or whatever. And here's what we have found at our church, that people grow the most or they advance the most in their Christian walk in two moments of life, need to know moments and need to grow moments. So I'm going to look at it like this. Has anybody in here ever put together an Ikea piece of furniture? Yes. Right? And so if you're like me, you think you know everything, and you don't want to have to read the directions, so you look at the pictures. <laughs> yep. And I look at the outside of the box, or I look at the main image on the manual, and I say, I got this. So you start putting it together, and then all of a sudden you're like, wait a second. This is not coming out like the picture. There's something not going right. And inevitably, you've got to reach for the instructions and find what step you missed, what part you didn't put in, what screw you didn't put in, go back to that step, possibly take it back apart, and do it the way that the instructions said. I, got, I went to the instructions when I needed to know what I didn't know, what the picture wasn't showing me or what I couldn't calculate in my mind. I was trying to do something that I didn't have all the information based upon the picture that I had, and I had to go back into the instructions. And we want you as a church to be prepared for moments like that in your spiritual life. Know how to reach for the instructions, how to get to the correct step of what you're missing or what part isn't there in order to have a successful Christian life. We want to be able to find out what God's word says about the situations that you find yourself in and how to fix them and how to correct them. So before we begin, I want to share with everybody in here one of my pet peeves. And I think a lot of you know one of these pet peeves, but it's there. And a pet peeve of mine is the little red notifications on any of my apps on my phone. I cannot have them. <laughs> I lit every single day I open almost every app that has a notification and somehow have to clear it or fix it. I just, I can't stand it, right? And it drives me crazy when I look at someone else's phone, or I look at their laptop, or their iPad, and I see in their email a red notification that says 10 million <laughs> unread <laughs> emails. Honestly, I begin to wonder about you. 
I do. I wonder about you. I judge you in my mind. Not out loud, because I'm a Christian, but in my mind, I judge you. The whole staff knows it, because I look over their shoulder and be like, man, there's something wrong with you. <laughs> now, I don't judge yourself. I'm not judging your salvation, but I'm wondering, like, what's up? Like, clean up your inbox. But why would someone have 10 million unread emails? Tell me. Why would someone have so many unread emails and not delete them from the inbox? Just background noise in their life that they chose to ignore. Yeah, yeah. right? Background noise. Yep. Or it's got so much data or it, it's just a junk ad or whatever it is, right? All this noise and we choose to disregard all of the content because we have so much content. And I think that same mentality comes into how we think about the Bible, right? There's so many scriptures from the Old Testament to the New Testament, Genesis to Revelation, where do I start? What do I read? And I think a lot of Christians then just don't do it. They leave the messages from God left unread. Mm. And I think that if, if we had little red bubbles over all of our heads, there might be 10 million unread messages from God, right? That we just haven't checked. We haven't yeah. gone in there. We haven't sorted through. And we miss out on deals. Yeah. We miss out on blessings. Yeah. We miss out on advice. We yeah. miss out on warnings because we don't read the messages from heaven. Yeah. Anybody got any input on that? Yeah, I think a lot of times when it comes to these messages that we have, sometimes as a Christian, it could feel frustrating to be stuck on like, say it's the Ikea furniture. I'm on step seven and I'm frustrated because it's not going together. And it's like God has outlined step two early on in the process that if we do the things in the right order, that we're in a spot where we don't have to worry about when we get further down the line trying to figure it out. Mm. In my life, I am a professional at when it comes to Ikea stuff. I'll start it, try to go, go, go. I'm on step seven and something's not fitting because I didn't do step two yeah. way back when. And it's like I've noticed in my life that even in the times when I'm messing up that I feel like God is working out things in my life in a certain order so that when I get to step seven, when I'm on staff, whatever, now I have the foundation to move forward in my life. Right, so what's the real hard thing about that, right? It's like trusting it's like, that God has that plan mapped yes. out. The Bible tells us, lean not to our own understanding, but in all our ways acknowledge him, yeah. and he will what? Direct, direct our direct steps. Our path. Yeah. Right? I mean, the, word, the Bible says paths, right? But he's going to direct those steps, and he's going to order the steps. The steps of a righteous man are ordered mm. of the Lord. He puts yeah. them in the right order so that we come out with the proper product. Yeah. So here's what we know. God reveals himself to, to, through, to humanity, I'm sorry, through two primary means. God reveals himself to humanity through two primary means, words and actions. He reveals himself through words, and he reveals himself through actions. Now, some people in this group here, you are very motivated by words. Words matter. Pastor John Mark is a words of affirmation, right? So if it ever comes to a moment where I have to address a situation with John Mark, uh, I actually have to start that with, hey man, I love you, care about you, you're my friend, you screwed up, here's a problem, I love you, I care about <laughs> yeah. you, let's keep moving, right? Because words matter to you, right? They, they matter a whole lot in how things are said, not only just the way, the, what words are being said, and the way that they're delivered, and when they're delivered, you know, did I just have this Thing that I'm struggling with and I already know I'm struggling with it and if someone brings up something to me sometimes if it's like you know you need to be fixing this I beat myself up more because of the way something's being said but learning for myself is to just receive it and then think about yeah. what's being said so let's take that a step further does it matter to you who the words come from it does it does it it depends on the level of influence a person has in my life. If a person is just somebody down the street, say, oh, you did a great job preaching. But if Pastor Mike or Josh or, or, or Pastor Chris or one of the staff pastors or any of the staff come up to me and say, hey, man, that was a really great message, I know because uh, most of them know what it takes to put a sermon together. And it's like, I really did a great right, job. So let's think about that, right? The source of words matter. So if we understand that the words that we have in our Bible are not just ideas and thoughts mm. of man, but literal words from our Heavenly Father sent to us, it should carry some more weight, right? Yeah. 
But God is so good that he doesn't just do words. He doesn't just give us the love language words of affirmation. He also has gone ahead and done acts of service, yeah. right? He put action to the words that he said. So in the Bible, both of these mediums of revelation work together and are interconnected. For example, God has revealed himself in human history through his mighty deeds and his works, and these actions have been recorded and written down in scripture, right? So he did these mighty deeds and works, but he also had them delivered to us in words so that we can read them, understand them, and pass them along to future generation. God also speaks directly to and through prophets in the Bible, which is documented again in words in the canonization of scripture. Uh, during our Bible study course, we talked about what canonizing means. It's a tape measure. It's a ruler. It's a way that we can judge or determine something in, in um, length. And so that's kind of what the canon of Scripture is. It's the way that we can judge and determine what is true, what is right, what is holy. God's word is truth. Yes. Jesus said that. Yes. He's come to bring truth to the world. But even Scripture was not enough. Understand this. Scripture was not enough to fully reveal God to us. Correct. As John alludes in John 21, 25, he says this, there were also so many other things that Jesus did uh, were, were every one of them written down, I suppose that the world itself could not contain the books that would be written. So think about that. The Bible in and of itself couldn't contain all of the acts and deeds that Jesus did. So just scripture alone wasn't enough. God had to come in human form to manifest and bring full truth and the gospel to us. In 2017, this verse actually became uh, pretty convicting to me. I don't know if anybody was around at that time when I taught on this scripture. Um, God didn't convict me. It was my own personal view of my lack of progress that I felt convicted me. I don't know if anybody in here has judged your own life and you said, man, I feel like I should be further along in life by now or I should have accomplished different things or I should have saved more money or I should have had a bigger house or a better car, right? Yeah. So I read the scripture and maybe it doesn't do it to you but it convicted it to me. This scripture literally, literally says in Jesus' three years, three years of ministry, he did so many things for the kingdom of God, that the world itself could not contain the amount of books that would be written to hold it all. Hmm. And I sat back and I was like, oh my God, have I done enough for the kingdom of God hmm. to fill the back of a business card? Yeah. You know, like one little piece of paper, have I done enough? And so it was kind of like a, a sermon that I preached about, you know, God's not judging you based upon that. He's not upset. But in our own lives, do we feel like we're accomplishing things for the kingdom of God? Now, that's not the standard for all of us. The, the Bible doesn't say that we should all do enough that the world can't contain the books that would be written about our yeah. lives. That, that's not the point, what I'm saying here. I'm saying for me, it was a motivation to apply myself to accomplish more for the kingdom of God. Yeah. That scripture there. So the word had become flesh. God's greatest and clearest revelation of himself is found in the person of Jesus of Nazareth. Yes. Christ is the word of God spoken to the world. He's the incarnation, it's called, right? The incarnation function functions as the final and personal revelation of God. Incarnation simply means God made human, right? God coming in human form. There are many different mediums of human communication. We'll talk about this one for a minute, right? How do we communicate today? We have snail mail. <laughs> What else? Text, Text messages, email. email, social media, social media, talking, phone call. Yeah. We, I mean, Face we barely time. do that anymore, yeah. anymore right? FaceTime. FaceTime. Yeah. Right. So we have these mediums of social connection, ways that we interact. However, what is the most effective way of communicating? Right here. Face to face. Yeah. Face to face. Why? We're going to put it up on screen a text message. This text message says, what are you doing? Why aren't you here? And it's all capital letters. What are you doing? Why aren't you now? Someone says that. Someone sends you a text message, all capital letters. What are you doing? Question mark. Why aren't you here? Question mark, exclamation mark. 
What does that mean to you? I think they're yelling at me. Lower your voice. Lower your voice. All right, so why did that not mean I'm concerned about you? The caps. The weight was written. Right, so we're making an assumption based upon our own personal lens, based upon how we text somebody else when we're upset, they're upset at me, they're mad. Right. We have no context to actually know what they meant. Yes. They literally could have just accidentally double tapped the shift key <laughs> on their uh-huh. keyboard and just wrote it in caps. Or they like capital letters like me. <laughs> or they're weird like you and like capital letters and does. <laughs> All right, we, you don't know, but the moment you then see that and then you go face to face, you say, why were you yelling at me? What are you talking about? We well, yeah. wrote all caps. Well, yeah. I always write all caps. I love all caps. Yeah. Or I did write all caps because I was concerned about you. I'm not yeah. mad. I'm not angry, right? Yeah. So the face to face conversation clarifies what is written. Yeah. Come on. Can we connect any dots here yet? Similarly, God's face-to-face, impersonal revelation of himself to us is the most effective way for him to speak to humanity. Yeah. Come on. It's the most effective way, right? So he sent his word, the Bible says, he sent the word to perform these things. Then he sends himself to reveal the meaning of those things. He spent day and night with disciples and going from town and village, teaching and preaching, revealing what those scriptures meant. And I almost wish, I mean, does anybody else wish that we actually had all the teachings that he gave? Yeah. If we were there there in his time. We have actually so few of them. Yeah. Yeah. We have Sermon on the Mount. We have Beatitudes. We've got some. We've got his, um, his parables. But like, what were those teachings that, Everybody in that village got healed. Yeah, yeah. wouldn't it be nice to hear it face to face from his very mouth yeah. with his emotion and his, yeah. you know, looking right at us included in that. Reading it on a page, we kind of get our own, see it through our own lens, and yep. we kind of put our own interpretation on it sometimes, I think. Yeah, and I think that's the downfall of theology is that we take Scripture and re- re- read it through the lenses of our theology if you believe that God was angry and he was upset and that every time you mess up, you're going to go to hell and you got to get resaved, then when you read scripture, your confirmation bias is going to find all of those yeah. scriptures that point that way. Correct. And you're not going to see grace and mercy. Yeah. Right? So Jesus came to earth to express to us face to face what the mission of heaven is. And then he left us the instructions. Right? He comes. He shares it, and he leaves us the instructions, and sometimes we still don't get it right. Yeah. One of the main purposes of the incarnation, or Jesus coming to earth in the flesh, was to reveal God. And Scripture says, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. If you've seen me, you've seen God. And John makes this abundantly clear in John 1.18. No one has ever seen God, the only God, who is at the Father's side, he has made him known. Yes. Jesus Christ made the Father known. He said, don't do anything I haven't seen the Father do. I don't say anything I haven't heard the Father say. I don't act any way that I haven't seen the Father act. So if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Yeah. John Calvin said this, the incarnation is a gracious act of divine accommodation. Mm-hmm. He accommodated humanity to kind of bridge that gap between the divine and and the human, yeah. so we can understand things. So in becoming flesh and dwelling among us, God is accommodating to us, speaking to us in human terms, in a language that we can appreciate and comprehend. Yeah. Unfortunately for us, if Jesus was here right now, he'd be speaking Aramaic, and none of us would understand <laughs> what he was saying. <laughs> We'd have to have like praying tongues for us to like, <laughs> have tongues and interpretation to get what you're saying. In the film Arrival, directed by uh, Dennis Val, someone help me out here, Villeneuve, there's an actress named um, Amy Adams. She plays a linguist 
who is hired by the military to learn how to communicate with alien life forms that have arrived on Earth out of the blue. In order to do this, the character must figure out how to accommodate to understand the alien species, to contextualize their messages, and to speak to these foreign creatures. And God does the same, uh, something similar in communicating with us through the word made flesh, Jesus Christ. Yeah. How is God, who is spirit, going to communicate to humanity? And he did that by sending his son in human likeness, in human form, in order to do that. So the Bible is a means of knowing God himself, knowing the heartbeat of God. Anybody in here ever write a love letter? Yeah. Come on, Sean. You ever write a love letter to your husband, Ray? Yes, I have. I'm thinking about you, my booby boo. <laughs> right? What did those love letters, not specifics, but <laughs> keep this PG-13. What was the gist, like what, what was the heartbeat behind a love letter that you may have written? Um, well, just sharing my love for him, telling him how much I love him, appreciating him so he knows yeah. how I feel about him. And by doing that, right, he got to know you. Yeah. And so God wrote a love letter to us to reveal himself to us, that we could get to know him. We could understand him. We could know the attributes, know his yeah. love, his emotions, his desires, Right? The goal of personal devotions or time in the Word of God is to grow in our relationship with a love of God. Yes. We should be growing in a love of God. Right? It, is possible, it is possible to possess a great amount of biblical knowledge, yet lack a relationship with God. Mm -hmm. yeah. Come on. Yeah. Yeah. I think there's churches that got a lot of people who... They could quote 10 different Bible verses in a second. Yep. But when you ask them about their relationship with God, their trust in God, mm -hmm. it might be lacking. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's what the religious lawyers and teachers did of Jesus' day. It's like he says in John chapter 5, you search the scriptures for you think in them you have life. And he says, I am life. Mm -hmm. So it's like you're searching the Bible trying to find life in it, but life is only found in the person of Jesus Christ. And it's like if you... um. If you get those two things mixed up, you can know all the scriptures in the world. And like Paul says in 1 Corinthians, and have not love. You can do all these things. But if you lack love, it's like you're, lack, you're lacking the basics. Yeah. And Jesus even says that within the law, that the weightier matters of the law are like mercy, justice, righteousness, the way that you're caring for those who are around you. It's like many times you get it backwards, but it's like what you're saying. It's like when you connect with God's word and connect with his heart behind the words, then it makes everything look different. Right. So yeah. let's do a little test here, right? Daintily, what is my favorite dinner meal? I don't know. Okay. <laughs> Why don't you know? Because I've never had dinner with you. Right. So we're yeah. pretty new to knowing each other. Right. Right. Cindy, what's my favorite dinner meal? Um... I honestly don't You're know. You're ruining this entire <laughs> illustration. <laughs> if you make anything up, I'm going to agree with you just to prove my point. <laughs> Say communion. Yeah. Communion. The Lord's Supper. Yes. <laughs> I would say something that you're, um, you like the, my mind <laughs> like, <laughs> What's your mom makes? We have put her on the spot here. <laughs> yeah, the sour, something with sauerkraut. What's your mom makes? Something completely that I don't make. <laughs> so family church, when you do an organic live feed <laughs> like we're doing now, you can set yourself up for absolute failure. <laughs> my point that I was trying to make was this, <laughs> is that my wife should know me better than other people because she cooks for me every <laughs> single day. <laughs> And after 22 years of living in the same house and having gazillions of meals, she should know <laughs> at least one of my favorite meals where daintily, right? We've not sat down and she said, hey, what's your favorite meal? I'm going to cook a dinner for you, mm -hmm. right? So like based upon um, relationship and time and knowledge, 
there's things that you begin to know and share with other people, right? So the more time you spend with God Mm -hmm. and the more time you spend in his word, the more you're going to know his characteristics, his heartbeat, his love, and those things. It grows out of that, right? It is possible to possess an intellectual knowledge of God through Bible study without transformative knowledge Amen. of God through a living and breathing relationship. Amen. Mm-hmm. And that's a dangerous place to find yourself in. That you think because you know scripture or you've read the Bible that you've allowed it to transform your life. It's a fallacy, yeah. right? And like Pastor Josh said, the Pharisees were those exact same things. Um, Jesus said to the Pharisees, you wash the outside of the cup, but the inside is dirty. Mm. So he's saying like, you've got all the right actions and all the right deeds and you know all the right scriptures, but inside you're empty. You're full of dead man's bones. Go ahead, Ashley. Yeah, something else we see a lot of here are people coming into the church with past church hurts. Mm -hmm. And and so they, they maybe didn't have or have not yet had a relationship with the Lord, but they're taking information that they heard secondhand from someone else. Mm-hmm. Um, so maybe they're getting wrong doctrine, wrong theology. And so we give them this opportunity to welcome them as they are and help them in those steps to develop a relationship yeah. so they can see that one-on-one. Yeah, that's good. Someone give us an example of someone in the Bible trying to do an action or deed in someone else's name other than Jesus. Come on. Somebody knows this story. <laughs> the seven sons of Sceva. They said, they, they try to cast out a demon, but they said, we cast you out in the name of the person Paul preaches. And they said, and they said, wait, wait, Jesus I know, Paul I know, but who are you? And then the demons beat him up, beat him up and then they so Second hand hurt. knowledge. Yeah. They knew the formula. They saw what Paul was doing, but they had no relationship with the Christ himself. Therefore, they had no authority to operate in any other name. We cast you out in the name of Jesus that Paul preaches, not the name of Jesus that lives and abides within me. Right? So it's a great point. Some theologians invest their entire lives studying Scripture, revealing Scripture, trying to create theological doctrine but yet have not allowed the scripture to become alive and powerful and sharper than a two-edged sword within them. Mm. So I'm going to say this, and we're building this all up before we learn how to read our Bibles because we've got to have faith. Faith comes by hearing by the word of God. So I'm telling you this, reading text is not enough. My son, he's 10 years old and he's learning to read. He's in these classes and my son can read the book And the moment he's done ringing, I say, okay, son, what was that about? He says, I have no idea. (laughs) Like, you just read the entire page. You don't know what you just read? I have no idea. Why? Because he's so focused on reading words that he's not allowing the story Mm. to develop and be revealed in his Mm. mind and in his heart and experience what's happening. And, And sometimes that happens when you read the Bible, right? You can just be reading text to say like, well, I'm going to do a reading plan and I'm going to read the entire Bible. And it's about word consumption instead of life change. And so the scripture needs to be transformative in your life. It Mm. needs to become a living part of who you are. In addition, if we want to know who God is and what Christianity teaches, we should look no further than Jesus himself. Mm. And I think sometimes the church kind of gets off track when we focus so much on all the other teachings and all the other theories of the Bible and we lose the main focus of what Jesus was teaching and preaching. He never got into politics. He was never about judging. He was talking about making the gospel accessible to all and bringing the kingdom to earth. Jesus is the self-revelation of God himself. All Bible study should revolve around Jesus lead us to Jesus, and end with Jesus. We learn this in our class on Wednesday night, that the Bible, like the calendar, is divided in two time periods or two sections. We have the Old Testament and the New Testament. Josh, why don't you tell us a little bit about that? Yes, so we've got the Old Testament and we've got the New Testament, and we believe that both are completely inspired by God and that the division point between old and new is the person of Jesus Christ. So it's like Pastor Mike was sharing on Wednesday, our calendars themselves are divided around the person of Jesus Christ, 
because that's how significant his life was. And in our secular society, they try to remove it, and they say BCE, before current events. And then you ask, what event made things current? The life of Jesus Christ. So it's like time itself cannot escape the influence that this man has had. And like we're talking about reading the Bible, wouldn't you want to know what that man says about our lives, about what we're doing? But yeah, but Old and New Testament. Yeah, so the division between the Old Testament and New Testament is Jesus Christ. B.C. is Old Testament. A.D., um, the year of our Lord, is the New Testament. So if you want to begin to read scripture and discover the life of Christ, we recommend starting in the book of John or starting in the book of Acts, somewhere where we're getting the life of Jesus or the acts of the apostles who were influenced by Jesus. We're going to get those stories. If you try to start in the book of Leviticus or you try to start in the book of Numbers or start in the book of Job, Dantley's reading the book of Job right now, bless her heart. It can be very difficult if that's your first attempt at consuming scripture. Please don't take the Bible and read it from Genesis to Revelation unless you're like an intellect who really loves to study these things because you're going to get lost and you're not really going to fully understand God's uh, relationship with humanity over time. Let's start with Jesus. What was his life like? What did he go through? Why did he die for us? And then get into the Acts of the Apostles. That's the beginning of the local church. So based upon the experience of Jesus, how did he establish his, his church on the earth today? And that's in the book of Acts. Um, it, it's also still not too late to sign up for our Wednesday night Bible studies. If you want to come on out, uh, you can come out this Wednesday night. We're going to be learning about the life of Jesus and his ministry and his, his, uh, his works that he was this Wednesday night. So if you're interested in that, come on out. And uh, I want to close with this, and you guys can jump in and when I'm done with this part right here, but... Please do not leave the messages from heaven unread. Don't leave the little red tab glowing over your head forever. I truly believe that the Holy Spirit wants to speak to you, that the word of God wants to speak to you. He's got deals. He's got blessings. He's got warnings. He's got discounts, right? If you would just open the messages, read them, don't delete them. Yeah. Sort them. What's that? Don't delete them. Yeah, don't them. delete them. Yeah. Sort them. Don't convince yourself that you're too busy to read the Bible. Don't convince yourself that you can't read it or you're not a reader. Let the word of God speak to your heart. Yeah, I just wanted to add when we were discussing why do people leave those messages unread, one of the reasons is because it's overwhelming. And that's what people tend to find about the Bible. So whether they're a new believer or just never got into the word, that's one of the main reasons. So to your point, starting off with John or Acts or, or Romans um, and, and getting some kind of plan using the Bible app and uh, last night's Bible study, the Wednesday night Bible study gave us a lot of tips on what we can do to help guide us through the word. Yeah. So that's really yeah, helpful. Without a proper reading plan, I would even say if you're really trying to start out something really basic, go to the Bible app, bible.com, download that app and go to a devotional plan. There's a bunch of them. You can go to any topic. So who can talk about that? Who's like really proficient in that? Who's? Yeah, go ahead. Redeem yourself from the whole (laughs) dinner thing. Um, Yes, if you go into the Bible app and go into their devotional section, you can actually go through the different categories of devotions that they have, uh, whether it's just ones specifically for men, specifically for women. They have ones that um, for teens, boys and girls, like they split them up. You could do ones that are very specific to issues that you may be dealing with, whether it's grief or being a parent or someone who's just going through some sort of loss. And you can go through, and some of them are short, like a few days long, and some of them are kind of extensive. But every day you'll get a reminder. I want to end with this. So if you think like you're struggling, like I don't know that I could do that, Matthew 7, verse 7 and 8, ask and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be open for you. For everyone who asks, receives. Mm. The one who seeks, finds. And the one who knocks, the door will be open. Yeah. So if you lack anything, the Bible says, ask God. Yeah. Ask him for help. Ask the Holy Spirit to help you. Open the eyes of your understanding. Show you things to come. Speak to your heart. Amen? Amen. Let me pray for you. Father, we thank you for this time that we could have a conversation around your word. We are lifted up, iron sharpens iron. We're energized from this conversation today. 
I pray that it was a blessing to our church during this snowy season. Lift us up. Lord, I pray protection over everybody throughout this week as they clean their driveways and recover from the snow. Lord, we praise you and thank you for your good acts and your good deeds, not just writing a letter to us, but coming to earth in, in human form to speak to us face to face. We thank you for that. We praise you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Love you guys. Have a great weekend.